Excellent, thank you. So, um, just one more um, opportunity to, somebody said on Twitter, bend my brain. They said they're having their brain or their mind bent by beyond. That's good, that's what we were setting out to achieve. Hopefully we're doing that. Somebody else said, could somebody please mention the phrase Anthropocene? So there you go, I just did that. Um, <laughs> if you've got other things, birthdays, bar mitzvahs, um, you know, if you, if you retweet and, and donate to charity, I'll say just about anything legal. Um, so, um, our final provocation of the morning session. So we've had a provocation on artists and artist-led innovation. We've had a provocation on design and design-led in, in, uh, innovation from Claire and from Rachel. So next, um, Professor Dave Bull. So, and Dave is uh, one of the world's leading um, visual, video and, sig and audio signal um, engineering experts, amongst many other things. Um, he's strategic advisor to the EPSRC, uh, professor of signal processing at Bristol, um, where he runs a, a really extraordinary program, um, looking at a lot of the very significant technologies that underpin some of the things we're talking about, and lots of other areas as well. Uh, he's super published, 450 articles, all those things, um, and uh, really looking forward to what he has to say about the provocation, science underpins everything. So ladies and gentlemen, Professor Dave Bull. Thank you uh, very much for the introduction and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so Andrew asked me to talk about science underpins everything in 15 minutes. And I thought, well, that's a, that's a tall order. And then he said, well, actually, creative industries are nothing without science. I thought, oh, that's easy. I can do that. Um, so what We agreed in terms of the, um, <clears throat> the description was advances in the creative industries are driven by progress in the behavioral engineering and science disciplines, creative processes that interact and understand the underpinning science or those that will make an impact. Um, I'm not sure that's particularly provocative. I think it's kind of common sense, really. Um, what I'm going to try to do is to go through, um, through mainly through, through examples of how technology does in many ways lead the creative sector, how it's an enabler, an analyzer, but also an inspiration for, for creative content. And actually also how human hunger for uh, interesting, engaging, informative content really is driving technology. So this kind of circle. And I'm, gonna, I'm going to put that within the framework of what I call a creative continuum, which is something that recognizes, understands, and exploits the interactions, interdependencies between the, the design, the capture, the delivery, and the consumption processes. Recognizes those are all highly interrelated. We need to understand how they interact uh, with each other. We need to understand engagement. We need to understand immersion. And we need to emphasize, really, that, that demands interdisciplinarity um, between the disciplines, uh, working between the disciplines. Um, oops. So that uh, slide that's on the screen, I challenge anyone in the audience who's been involved in the creative sector, um, they haven't been touched or enabled or inspired uh, by one of those or more of those technologies right from the, the, the top left-hand corner, which was a photograph taken, given to me by, by Alice Roberts when she was making the incredible human journey. And this is, uh, we believe, the oldest <coughs> uh, drawing instrument. It's about 100,000 years old in uh, caves in, in South Africa. Uh, the, the oldest actual line drawings with ochre uh, are about 70,000 years old. And we go through, obviously, papyrus, printing press, film, global communications, uh, technology for smart devices, silicon, immersive headsets, etc. Those all impact upon us. Uh, if you think about the types of creative um, pieces that are, that are made, whether it's film, television, live, um, or uh, indeed uh, immersive content for VR, they're all touched by that, those technologies. So nothing too, too exciting. But actually, what it really boils down to, it's about understanding the, the uh, audience. It's about understanding people. In terms of visual, which is my, my, main, my main area, um, if we look at the human brain, around about 50% of the, the um, uh, cortical neurons are associated in some way with visual processes, uh, compared to uh, around about 10% for hearing, 10% for other senses, and the rest for thinking and motor functions and, and the like. And really, that does explain why vision is not only important for survival and um, 
and, and our everyday interaction with the world, but actually why we are stimulated by it, why it creates engagement, and why, why we, 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 we crave uh, so, 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 so much of it, how it can entertain and, and inform us. And if we look at um, that from a slightly different point of view, if we look at the, the amount of information that's um, communicated on the internet, that number down there is, is, is three zettabytes, three with 21 zeros after it, which is the amount of global internet traffic. That number below it, which is 80% of that, is, is roughly what is visual. So 80% of the internet is, is visual traffic. And um, much of that is, is fantastic. Companies like Netflix, as you may be aware, in peak time in the US, about 30%, over 30% of peak time internet traffic is due to one company, uh, Netflix. Fantastic content, although an awful lot of it is less. <laughs> <coughs> less so and um, perhaps less, less creative, at least in its, its creation, but maybe the actors are fantastic. Um, so I want to go through just a quick few examples of where, um, where, where technology and science have been uh, an inspiration or a uh, means of analysis or a means of underpinning, enabling creation. So this is, this is Dutchill's Annunciation 1311. And what some colleagues of mine did, Uta Leonard's and, and colleagues, was to try to understand if you're, if you're displaying this, where would it have been? What, what was the contemporary lighting? Well, actually, it wasn't diffuse lighting in a, in a museum or a gallery. It was, it was actually candle lit. And the, the gold leaf really does have an impact when when lit by candle, candlelight in terms of changing the way people view the image. They did a lot of eye tracking and understood that actually your, your view, your fixations are, are, are taken away from the, the angel and the virgin's face down, down lower, which may, be, maybe, may have been understood by, by the artist in terms of being perhaps slightly irre irre irreverent uh, looking at the face. If we look at, may, m many people may not have heard of Al Haytham. Al Haytham was really the father of, of optics and um, was first to under, understand the, the role of the brain in perception, not, not just through in visual perception, not through the, just through the eyes. And his uh, a book of optics was translated around about 1420 into, in, into Latin. And uh, around about 1430 or so, uh, Renaissance art made a transformation in terms of its realism, and certain certain people will, would 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 claim and would argue, uh, Hockney and and others, that this transformation, this dramatic change, was due to an understanding of optical processes, which is due to the publication of Al Haytham's book. Some would disagree. So Scorsese, the Aviator, um, we're looking at chemical imperfections in film stock in two two strip and three strip Technicolor actually exploited by Scorsese in terms of telling the story of the timeline of Howard Hughes's life through the early days of the two-strip, through the three-strip, et cetera, processes, actually using technology to emulate the imperfections of, of, of color film stock. The imperfections in transmission actually can become an art form. So, you know, we don't like the fact that the predictive mechanisms used in compression actually cause distortions. But actually, some people are using this to create art, uh, like you see here, and indeed others like Lou Jaram in The Impossible Garden to create physical artworks as well. Escher obviously knew an awful lot about visual illusions. Visual illusions are a very, very powerful way of of um, exciting, challenging, and entertaining us in terms of our visual perception. Escher was really a, a mathematician, although he steadfastly denied he knew anything about mathematics, but he is, he is revered by mathem mathematicians worldwide for his illusions. This, um, I, I put it in because it's, it's kind of very, very interesting. This is Hockney. And what Hockney is, I've taken this chair and, and looked at it from very, very different viewpoints in, and uh, made a collage of those. The, the fantastic thing to me about this is actually, uh, not only do you recognize it's a chair, but actually you can see depth in it as well. The fact that it's got these multiple viewpoints. And I think, you know, it starts to challenge us in terms of what is depth? What do we need 3D stereopsis? Or is that the only way we can create depth and all of the other visual depth cues that we, 
that we use. And we get on to visualization as an art form. So David Glowacki, in terms of his dance room spectroscopy, actually modeling the interactions in force fields, the way people I interact with those and how they bend and distort those force fields. If you saw the, the, the paper, you probably skip over that. If you see the demonstration, you will be amazed. And of course, you know, to finish in terms of Shakespeare's um, Tempest and the 2016 enactment by the Royal Shakespeare Company with Intel Imaginarium actually creating the avatar of, of Ariel on stage and the amazing interaction between the technology that transformed the, the, um, the, the presentation. So I want to just um, quickly go on to, to look at perhaps a few cautionary tales. I think you know, it's, it's obvious that there's very little in the creative world that somehow isn't touched by technology. But one has to be careful. There's an awful lot of hype because technology is associated in many ways with lots of big investments, R&D programs, um, big, big businesses. And um, back in 2008-9, in terms of the research world, you really, in terms of my research world anyway, you really couldn't get any funding, the sort of stuff I do without doing 3D. Uh, following on from um, Avatar and and one or two other successful 3D movies, huge investments certainly by the TV manufacturers in, in 3D technologies. Um, and I think as of last year, there was no TV manufacturer making 3D uh, displays anymore. So the fact that that hype and that investment actually is, is decreased, one needs to learn lessons from that. Why was it? I mean, there are, you know, 3D is now being used in uh, in head-mounted displays, so we need to learn the lessons of that. I mean, first of all, obviously, the, the glasses. The actual understanding of how to make the content was not, was not well understood because of the interactions between the, for example, the, the, um, um, the uh, convergence, the vergence of the eyes on the object that is being presented to you and the combination of the eyes, the way they focus on the screen, which is where the, the image resides. So that conflict in those two processes which are intimately linked can cause nausea, they can cause fatigue, and that's why well, a lot of people uh, don't like it. Um, also, in, in terms of many, many other issues, I said the, the way content was produced, the way, the fact that stereopsis in many ways one could argue was, was evolved for working within two or three meters of, of, uh, of, of the body, not for longer range things. And there are many other depth cues, motion parallax and many other things that are used and a lot of prior knowledge to, to inform depth over larger areas. And of course, when we go on to the, the, um, <clears throat> the current uh, wave of enthusiasm that surrounds uh, the R's, VR, AR, uh, MR, you know, we are creating that same level of hype, and that's great because it, it, it gets interest in the technology, it allows the technology to, to be developed, it creates the investment for that technology. Are we going to realize these types of markets? I very much doubt it. If you've heard in, in, in the uh, news recently, the sales of head headsets are actually pretty, pretty flat at the moment. And there are a lot of reasons for that. I mean, this, this, this virgence accommodation issue in headsets is significantly accentuated compared to flat screen TVs. So that's an issue we need to deal with. And technologies exist, uh, at least in the laboratories, and to a certain extent, arguably, in some headsets of light fields, um, although that's debatable. Um, uh, that, that can address that issue by, by allowing you to refocus on the, um, on the, virtual, on the virtual image. So those, those areas need to be addressed, but actually, you know, when you're sacrificing, in a, in a VR environment, you're sacrificing your, your, your main senses of hearing and vision to be in this, this um, enclosed environment, actually the impact on the other senses becomes again, far more accentuated. So the kind of sensory imbalance, the misalignment of the senses, especially the vestibular system can be, can be a big issue. Those are things that we need to address and really in, need to engage the content creators with understanding the technology and to evolve this technology to, uh, t together. We need to deliver it. Um, you know, the potential of uh, five, five G. I think Claire mentioned five G earlier in terms of the test bed that we have at uh, at, at, uh, at Bristol. The, the, bit, the bit rates that we 
demand from these more immersive experiences are, are huge. If we're going to deliver those over networks that exist currently, we need compression ratios of thousands to one. So for every, every one or two thousand bits you have in the original content, you've got one bit to transmit it. You know, that's hugely challenging. At the same time, you need to preserve those immersive properties of what was created in the studio when delivered to the user wherever they are, whenever they, whenever they want it. So 5G has is, is, is got the potential, but there are still many, many challenges we need, we need to address. And actually then when you consume it, how do you know what you're consuming, whether, whether the impact you're getting is from the narrative or from the, the technology? And this is a, a piece of work that uh, we've been working on at Bristol. I'll just show you quickly this. We, we did this with the BBC on using Blue Planet 2. And what, what we wanted to do was to compare the influence of dynamic range on engagement. And we realized that we, we define our engagement as the, the, the attention in, in one domain as opposed to another. And for example, a measure of that attention is how long it takes your brain to switch out of one task and into another. So we excite the, um, I'll go into the details of how we excite the, the viewers periodically through the, through the screening. And we, we measure physiological and attention metrics, including reaction times and, and the like. And what this shows you is actually you can differentiate, this shows a clear differentiation between people viewing the, exactly the same content in high dynamic range and standard dynamic range. So for the first time, we can start to extract, obviously to measure immersion, we need strong narrative. If we want to judge the technology, we need to subtract the narrative out of that, that equation. And we can start to do that now. So that's kind of looking very, very interesting. And we, 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 we obviously can apply this to HMDs as well. So I just want to finish by bringing all of that really together and to say, yeah, of course, technology underpins everything, science underpins everything. You know, where would we, we be now if scientific developments weren't informing the creative processes? At the same time, we need to recognize, understand, and exploit those interdependencies across the design, the capture, the delivery, and the consumption processes, because those all contribute to, to the experience. To do that, we need people working together. We need psychologists, we need engineers, computer scientists, and we need people in the creative arts to do that. Thank you.